Ladies and gentlemen, family and friends of the 2022 Cooper term class, welcome. On behalf of the Board of Trustees and the faculty and staff, we are delighted that you are attending the Nashville School of Law's 114th commencement ceremony. We are also delighted that you have joined us to recognize and honor these students who will be graduating today. The class of 2022's tenure at our school has been unique. The stress and uncertainty caused by the COVID-19 pandemic increased the usual burdens of law students for the last two and a half years and added some new unfamiliar challenges as well. Through it all, the class of 2022 found new ways to learn, study, and collaborate. And I congratulate each of you for your tenacity, your resilience and agility in overcoming these challenges. You deserve this celebration today. The degrees that we are about to confer and the diplomas we are about to bestow on each of you are the tangible rewards of the work and sacrifices not only of these students, but of their families, friends, and employers throughout the students' years of study and attendance at classes at night. All of us are appropriately proud of the class of 2022. Throughout our long history, our school has been guided by the visionary leaders that uh, are the members of our board of trustees. Uh, a number of the members of our board are here today and we're very fortunate that they were able to join us. And it's my privilege to introduce to you the chairman of our board, the nationally and even internationally renowned attorney and community leader, Aubrey Harwell, who will introduce his fellow board members. Congratulations to all the graduates. You all are what it's about. Your board is dedicated to protecting and preserving the mission of this school so that others will follow in your footsteps. But today's your day, so congratulations. Our board, I'll start on the far left, Mr. Gary Garfield, former general counsel, president, CEO of Bridgestone Firestone. Mr. John Rochford, incredible businessman, entrepreneur, runs a number of companies, graduate of this school. And then the Honorable Frank Clement, judge, probate court judge, court of appeals judge, and a credible asset. He asked me to say that to you all for our board, okay? <laughs> this is your board. Our students and our school's success rests in the hands of the dedicated women and men of our faculty. Each of these distinguished lawyers and judges has accepted the challenge, some for many years, of using their knowledge, their wisdom, and their experience to prepare our students for successful and rewarding careers. You are our faculty's legacy to the profession. It has been their goal to pass along to you not just an assortment of legal principles and rules, but also their abiding respect for the rule of law and the noble profession you all are about to enter. When you leave here today, you are taking a bit of each of us with you. We are fortunate that members of the faculty could join us this morning. I would appreciate it if they would stand to receive our recognition and thanks. If the faculty would stand. And our students and faculty go about their work in, in an environment created and maintained by a dedicated, efficient, experienced, and very small staff. Small in number, large in skills and accomplishment. The doors would not open, the lights would not be on, and the business of the school would not be conducted without these dedicated men and women. 
This ceremony today is the result of their planning and hard work. And if I may ask the NSL staff to stand and let us recognize and thank you. <laughs> Chairman Harwell will introduce our keynote speaker. Dean, thank you so much. One of the things that among many I'm proud of is that our Dean is a former member of the Supreme Court. I think that's incredible. Today's gonna to be a day that you all remember, all of you graduates will remember it. It's a day that will be remembered by you, by the faculty, by your families, and by your supporters. Over time, as you age, some of those things that happened today are gonna to fade from your memory. It's a true honor today to have <clears throat> a member of the Supreme Court here to address this graduating class. You will remember that. That will be part of what you recall in the years to come. Justice Holly Kirby has an incredibly rich legacy in the law. She graduated from the University of Memphis Cecil Humphrey School of Law. She was number three in her class. She was a notes editor for the Law Review. She clerked for an incredibly well-respected judge, Harry Welford, United States Court of Appeals, Sixth Circuit. She practiced law. She was the first female partner at one of the finest firms in this state, the Memphis-based Birch, Porter, and Johnson. In 1995, she went on the Court of Appeals by appointment. Then Governor Bill Haslam appointed her to the state Supreme Court in 2014. She has served on that court admirably from that point forward. She is a graduate of the Cecil Humphrey School of Law. She's the first graduate of that law school to serve on our Supreme Court. I got from the dean a list of all of her honors, and I looked at it, and I thought, if I go through those, this program's going to go till about 1 o'clock, so I'm not going to go through all those. But I can tell you, she's been a member and a chair of the Appellate Court Nominating Committee, served on the Court of the Judiciary, Board of Judicial Conduct. Her many awards include Outstanding Alumni for the University of Memphis College of Engineering, Tennessee Justice Center Community Mother of the Year, and the list goes on and on and on. We're honored to have her. Join me in welcoming Supreme Court Justice Holly Kirby. Thank you, Mr. Harwell, for that kind introduction. Thank you, Dean Cote, for asking me to speak to this outstanding group of new graduates. I'm so honored to be in this room full of success stories. Don't tell anyone, but you guys are the court's favorites. <laughs> Certainly we love all of Tennessee's law schools, but graduates of the Nashville School of Law almost always have a story of obstacles they had to overcome in order to get through law school. And that just endears you to us. We know you'll really cherish your law degrees. I want to talk to you today about special responsibilities that go along with the privilege of the law license you are about to receive. Many of those responsibilities you already know. Guard your personal integrity, hold your clients' confidences sacred, protect individual constitutional rights, be honest and civil with your fellow lawyers, and help vulnerable citizens who cannot afford the legal protection they need. Those responsibilities you already know. But let's talk about a responsibility you may not know. It stems from the lawyer's historic role as stewards of the truth and guardians of our system of justice. In order to preserve our justice system, Lawyers have a special responsibility to preserve our form, our particular form in America, of democracy. Keep in mind, in America, our form of democracy is not simply majority rule. If it were, people in the minority wouldn't have rights, and people in the majority wouldn't be bound by rules and laws. In our form of democracy, all citizens are equal, whether they're in the majority or not. 
and our elected rulers must respect individual rights and the rule of law. Our justice system, the one you've just spent years learning about, can't exist outside that unique form of democracy. No other form of government would support an independent judiciary that protects the rights of the powerless and enforces the laws against the powerful. So if our democracy does not succeed, the justice system, as we know it, will not hold. You've probably heard that America's democracy is a great experiment. It's hard to overstate what an experiment it is. Historically, it's unprecedented. A few other countries have, a, have embraced a kind of democracy similar to ours, but what's historically unprecedented in our American experiment is that we've maintained our democracy in a country that's very ethnically and religiously diverse. Never before has that been done. There's no precedent in history for it. With that diversity comes great challenges, and those challenges may eventually cause America's democratic experiment to fail. If it does, our just justice system falls too. What will it take for America to remain a democracy years from now? One of the most important things is for people with very different backgrounds to be able to talk civilly to each other so they can make collective decisions. A huge barrier to that is that the viewpoints and the votes of those outside of our tribe are perceived as being not based on actual facts. Honestly, there's some truth to that perception. The reality is every day, people of every political belief make important civic decisions like voting and supporting candidates based on disinformation, things they've been told that just aren't true. I'll grant you lies and disinformation have been with us for a very long time, but never before have they been at the level they're at now. And that's a problem. Citizens want to make their own decisions in their civic life based on facts, but that's increasingly hard to do with a fire hose of misinformation aimed at all of us all the time. That fire hose of misinformation is no accident. It's an established technique. The idea is to flood the zone with so many competing voices and disinformation that it's overwhelming. And many people just end up and figure they'll never know what's true. And that's the goal. This is a phenomenon called the liar's dividend. The aim isn't necessarily to convince people the lie is true, as it is to create so much, much mistrust between people that it makes citizens passive and apathetic. You can't fight for what's true if you don't know what's true. Truth is being used as a weapon. The Justice Department tells us that no group is immune. Whatever group you may identify with, ethnic group, religion, political affiliation, sports team, Facebook group, any of us can be the target. And that's corrosive for a democracy like ours. Facts and truth are the foundation for rational, collective decision making. That's where we lawyers fit in. That's where you fit in. Why us lawyers? Since the American Revolution, lawyers like John Adams and Alexander Hamilton have played a crucial role in America's democracy. As lawyers, you are stewards of the truth. A recent case by your Tennessee Supreme Court held that the essential aim of our legal system is to seek truth in the pursuit of justice. All other duties and responsibilities are secondary. Everything you do as a lawyer comes second to your obligation to the truth. 
That special responsibility is reflected in the oath you'll take when you're sworn in as a lawyer not too long from now. In that oath, you'll swear to support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Tennessee. Those constitutions are the written embodiment of America's democratic system. So let's look at what we as lawyers can do. It turns out that the skills you've learned as a lawyer are uniquely suited to meet this moment for America. People are hungry to know what is fact, what is true. You now have the skills to discern what are objectively true facts. Let me give you an example. You may remember an old case called Hickman versus Taylor. Everyone in law school reads that case because it established the work product doctrine. I don't want to trigger any PTSD from any of you here. But. For our purposes today, the case just shows how good lawyers figure out baseline facts for their clients. In the Hickman case, a tugboat sank while towing a barge across the Delaware River. Five out of the nine crew members drowned, including a crew member named Hickman. A few days later, the tugboat hired a lawyer named Fortenbaugh because he knew he was about to get sued. What did Mr. Fortenbaugh do? First, he got together a set of questions, factual questions about what happened. Then Mr. Fortenbaugh began asking those questions of witnesses. First, he talked to witnesses on his own side, employees of the tugboat owner, and compared those answers to physical evidence at the scene. And then he talked to other witnesses not employed by his client and asked them the same kind of factual questions. Once he compared what all of them said, he could figure out what really happened when the tugboat sank. He knew he couldn't advise his client about potential liability until he knew the facts. The Hickman case illustrates how a good lawyer thinks. The lawyer's fact-finding method is a product of our justice system. Our justice system pits two sides against each other and requires both to ask hard questions of their own witnesses and of each other. It looks for evidence, not opinion. A judge or jury looks at all of this evidence before deciding what's true and what's not. The law, representing society's values, is only applied after the judge or jury has found the facts. That's how lawyers are trained to think. And it's transformative. Didn't law school transform the way you think about everything? Of course it did. I guarantee you all the people here with you today have noticed the change in your thinking. Right? No one leaves law school unchanged. That way of thinking is also transformative for regular citizens trying to make good faith decisions about how to vote and who to support. People can talk to each other more civilly and more constructively when they first come to general agreement about the basic facts. That's what lawyers do every day. So here's what you can do. Model that thinking to your friends and family. Be explicit about it. Show them how lawyers approach problems and gently bring them along. If all of us model the lawyer's way of thinking, it will have a positive impact on our public discourse. You have a sphere of influence. Your lawyer's mind is respected by your family and friends. For example, even though you're not yet licensed, how many of you are already basically in-house counsel for your friends and family? Raise your hand. Yeah. Use your influence for the public good. Our justice system cannot survive unless America maintains a free and fair democracy based on truth. If the people of Ukraine can risk their lives to defend their democracy, 
we can take a little risk to defend ours. It has been said, to whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. You've been given the gift of an excellent legal education. It's now your calling to fulfill your special responsibility to our country. I hope you'll be one of the hero lawyers. I hope you'll use your lawyer mind to lift up and heal our nation. Thank you for letting me share this day with you. Justice Kirby, on behalf of our graduating class and a grateful school, please accept this small gift as a token of our appreciation. Thank you. The Dean's Certificate of Recognition is awarded to today's graduates completing 50 hours of pro bono service throughout their law school career. This year we recognize Dennis Disney, Shannon Kerr, Danielle Montooth, Julie Downs Payne, Johnny Peppers, and Dylan Sykes, whose names will be submitted to the Tennessee Supreme Court to be considered as lawyers for justice. Uh, Re Receiving the Dean's Certificate of Excellence for recording the most pro, -no, pro bono hours in our school's pro, -no, pro, pro bono initiative is Robert Dillon Sykes. Mr. Sykes, if you would stand to be recognized. The Honorable Society of Cooper's Inn is comprised of the graduates who have distinguished themselves in their studies by graduating in the top 10% of their class. I request each inductee to stand and be recognized when their name is called and to remain standing until all have been recognized. Nicholas Alexander Bellamy. <laughs> Turner Smith Evans. Shannon Celeste Kerr, Robert Wesley Laxon, Stephanie Limbaugh Nolan, Julie Downs Payne, John David Peppers, and Matthew Stephen Wood. Congratulations to you all. The Founders Award is given to the student who has earned the highest overall grade point average in the graduating class during their four years of study. Be it known that this year's Founders Award recipient is Julie Downs Payne. Ms. Payne, please stand. And now, if I may, ladies and gentlemen of the graduating class of 2022, if you would all please stand. They haven't done anything yet. <laughs> By the authority vested in me as the fifth dean of the National School of Law, I hereby declare that each of these students is hereby awarded the degree of Doctor of Jurisprudence on this, the 28th day of May, 2022. Congratulations again to y'all. Joseph A.G.
Lauren Ann Alexander. Ashley Danielle Allen. Zachary Alexander Beard. Logan Carter Elliott Bell. Susan J. Bell. Nicholas Alexander Bellamy. Grant Doyle Benair. Lauren Ashley Bratton. Ariel Cornelia Catus. <laughs> Catherine Lee Chioza. Scott Morgan Clifton. Darwin Marquise Coleman. Scotty Colwell. <laughs> Tatiana Constable. John Raby Creason.
Michael Chad Cunningham. Dennis Glenn Disney. Richard T. Dunn. Turner Smith Evans. Richie L. Fields. Brooke Charlotte Fox. Jenna Tiarina Fuchs. Katie Lee Foltz. Tyresha Gray. Charles Clint Grissom. Kimberly Ann Guffey. Shelby Kayla Hale. <laughs> Justin Kyle Hall. Sarah Francis Hay. Gregory Scott Hazelwood. Britton Marcus Heaton. <laughs> e 
Evelyn Anna Grace Hall. Angela Denise Jones. Courtney Lene Jordan. <laughs> Stephanie Rochelle Jordan. Seth James Cantrick. <laughs> Shannon Kerr. Robert W. Laxon. <laughs> Craig William LaQuire. Alexandra Annalise Lovin. <laughs> Aubrey Michelle Malco. Jessica Leonore Malecki. <laughs> Matthew J. Mezzatesta. Tabitha Gail Molnar. Danielle Nicole Montooth. Maxwell Arthur Moody. <laughs> Hannah, 
Heather Lynn Moore. Rebecca Lee Moore. <laughs> Stephanie Limbaugh Nolan. Moon Brian Nymore. <laughs> Blake Parham. Julie Downs Payne. John David Peppers. Anna Carson Petrie. <laughs> Randall Weston Pierce, Sr. Samantha Jane Prince. <laughs> Kari Rochelle Redden. Bethany Janae Robinson. <laughs> Anna Elizabeth Rush. Nicole Savino. Ryan Nolan Savitsky.
Kayla Redmond Siegel. George Christopher Shelby. <laughs> Summer Jackson Skelton. Brittany Michelle Spears. <laughs> Neil Garland Stanton. Shelly Kenda Stice. <laughs> Giselle Sutherland. Robert Dylan Sykes. <laughs> Emily Rose Tatum. Donna Marie Tees. <laughs> Tori Reedy Terry. Jamie Renee Thomason. Jordan Lee Thomason. Kaylin Nicole Weiss. <laughs> Matthew Stephen Wood. Courtney Ann Worrell.
As all of you might imagine, each of today's 82 graduates can recount their experiences as students at the school in different and in wonderful ways and in different voices. Each graduate's story is worth telling. Because of time, we cannot give the mic to all 82 students, and we're very fortunate this morning that Rob Laxon is going to provide some brief parting words on behalf of his classmates. Mr. Pack Laxon is... Good morning. Grant Benier once told me after I got shot down by Dean Koch and Conlaw, words are important. I've kept that simple advice in mind ever since then, uh, especially uh, while thinking of how I could best represent our class today. On behalf of the National School of Law Class of 2022, I would like to thank Dean Cope, the Board of Trustees, our professors, our administration, faculty, and staff. You've given us an opportunity to better ourselves, change our lives, our families' lives, and make a meaningful impact on our communities, state, country, and world. You've shared with us wisdom, confidence, professionalism, and tenacity. I would like to take a moment to recognize each of our family members and friends who have made sacrifices <clears throat> similar to ours so that we may walk across this stage today. Those who've stayed behind to take care of children, manage our affairs as well as their own, and love and support us in every imaginable way. Each of us has someone who, if not for him, her, or them, we would not have been able to make it this far. For myself, my biggest supporter has been my wife, Gabby, she deserves this day and all the recognition that has and will come with it more than I do. Thank you. As today is a reflection of the, and celebration of the last four years, it has been a different journey for each of us. Each of us has encountered our own struggles, challenges, successes, and achievements. Think back to the first day of orientation and getting our student IDs, pictures made, which may now look nothing like us. Then remember our first year of law school exams and figuring out we could actually do this. Our second year brought a different challenge with four year-long courses that it seemed like would violate the rule against perpetuities. <laughs> Being a 3L brought the challenge of the real world in scheduling deadline after scheduling deadline. Finally, our fourth year was a race to the finish line, and our prize is the bar exam. I would remind you that your legal resume is already pretty impressive. Among other feats, you worked and studied through a global pandemic. You've also shared the room and questioned the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. Four years ago, we all had a dream. We were all in the process of turning those dreams into reality and applying to law school. We had realized, to quote President John F. Kennedy, there are risks and costs to action, but they are far less than the long-range risks of comfortable inaction. In the beginning, we were asked in an assignment why we wanted to go to law school. Over the last four years, we've transformed from dreamers to doers, and today, each of our whys become fully actionable. One of the major benefits of NSL is that we've been taught and trained by some of the, pra the best practicing and retired attorneys and judges in this state. They have given us an opportunity to thrive in the knowledge and skills to do so. Like us, they too worked during the day and came to law school at night. Let us remember that, just as they did, it is our obligation to help those that come after us. As we walk away today, Juris Doctors, we stand in impressive company. The same company that includes Juris Doctors from the most prestigious institutions. We share the same opportunity of becoming a licensed attorney and practicing law. We, however, earned our Juris Doctor the blue collar way. Our journey has been an uphill marathon. We've worked during the day. We've traveled to and sat through class at nighttime. We studied in the mornings before our families awoke or late at night after they'd fallen asleep. We studied on our lunch breaks. We have battled health issues and life crises. To paraphrase Greg Hazelwood, we've given our health to chase wealth. Today is the end of that marathon. It is a time to realize our opportunity and its value. It is also time to realize the responsibility that we will carry as attorneys, both while practicing pending admission and after being licensed. 
Not only will we be obligated to ethically and zealously represent our clients, we will be officers of the court, entrusted with seeking the truth in courts of law and equity, or entrusted with finding the truth as judges or legislators. It is the truth we must never lose sight of. Perhaps our most important job over the balance of our lives will be as guardians of the truth in a world where the meaning of truth seems to be hanging in the balance. As President Abraham Lincoln said, be sure you put your feet in the right place, then stand firm. We have each had experiences and made friendships that will stay with us for the rest of our time here on earth. I'm thankful for my time at the National School of Law, as well as the friendships, experience, and knowledge I've acquired along the way. It has been an enjoyable challenge and one that, outside of parenting my children, loving my wife, and following the Lord has been the greatest of my life. I'm honored to be among you today and share this final experience with you as a student, National School of Law, Class of 2022. Congratulations. Let's go change the world. Thank you, Mr. Laxon. As this ceremony draws to a close, if I may permit me to add just a few words of my own. Ladies and gentlemen of the class of 2022, you are the true dreamers in this room. The greatness of human beings is not so much in their ability to remake the world, but in their power to remake themselves. And that is precisely what you've done. Just as the note cards that mysteriously appeared in room 200 during your last week of school said victory is reserved for those who are willing to pay its price, each of you have paid that price. And it is that accomplishment that we celebrate today. But we celebrate knowing full well that other challenges await, some in the not too distant future. Sun Tzu also tells us, and I'll quote him here, it is the unemotional, reserved, calm, detached warrior who wins. Your task between today and July 26 is to believe that you can mold yourselves into a calm, detached warrior when you sit for the bar exam. All of you have studied law with intensity of purpose. Our goal has, to, has been to give each of you an opportunity to experience yourselves as capable and effective men and women. You are and should be more self-confident today than you were when you started law school. And we hope we have succeeded in empowering each one of you to believe deep in your souls that you matter and that your responses to the challenge that await you will make an enormous effect on other people's lives. As lawyers, having the ability means that you have the obligation not to squander that. We're living in uncertain times. The rule of law and the very foundations of our government are under assault from without and from within. The traditional norms of mutual tolerance and institutional forbearance uh, have been replaced by partisanship, division, and distrust. The principles of egalitarianism, civility, sense of freedom, and of shared purpose and responsibility that have long characterized our democracy are being tested. The founders of our nation set out to form a more perfect union. From the very beginning, the lawyers were the architects and builders of that union. As officers of the courts, lawyers, like the courts themselves, defend the Constitution. They must guard our liberties. They must protect the powerless. They must advocate for just causes, no matter how unpopular. And they must continue to serve as society's wise counselors. United States Supreme Court Justice Robert A. Jackson was fond of telling the parable of the three stonemasons. You won't find that in the Bible. It's a parable nonetheless. It goes something like this. Once upon a time, 
three stonemasons were asked, one after the other, what they were doing. The first said, without looking up, answered, I'm earning a living. The second replied, I'm shaping the stone according to the architect's design. The third stonemason lifted up his eyes and said, I'm building a cathedral. And so it is with lawyers. For some, their work is simply a way to make a living. For others, their work is to dutifully perform the tasks that they've been given. But for others, practicing law is a loftier exercise. It's building a cathedral. We call that cathedral the rule of law, a legal structure that will protect our rights and liberties for centuries to come. So what kind of lawyer will each of you be? Whenever some cynic tells you you can't make a difference, or whether you're attempted to set your sights lower than they are now, remember what the inspired lawyers that went before you have done. It was an appellate lawyer from Virginia that wrote the Declaration of Independence. It was a trial lawyer from Illinois that issued the Emancipation Proclamation. It was a corporate lawyer from New York that led our country through the Depression and World War II. And in 1973, it was two good old country lawyers from Huntsville, Tennessee and Morganton, North Carolina that demonstrated for the world that no person, not even the President of the United States, is above the law. So our nation is a work in progress. As lawyers, each of you are going to be able to narrow the gap between what America is and what it can be. You are at the threshold of entering a noble profession and you have accepted the responsibility to lead your community to embrace not power, but the rule of law. And I am confident that each and every one of you will rise to that challenge. And with these thoughts, members of the class of 2022, or may I say the great class of 2022, you have my congratulations and best wishes. And please rise for the benediction delivered by Matthew Mezzatesta. Let us pray. Lord God, you have been our refuge and strength from one generation to the other. We thank you for those gathered here to celebrate this most, most joyous and solemn day of achievement. We thank you for bringing the class of 2022 to the conclusion of our legal studies. And we humbly ask your blessing on the future because we know that you have prepared all of us for plans beyond our own imagination. We thank you for the privilege of being able to attend the National School of Law. And we humbly ask your blessing, O Lord, your blessing upon the school's faculty, staff, and students in the years ahead. We praise you for your faithfulness to us and our families these past four years, and we pray that you will guide us in the years to come. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.
Thank you.